Welcome all of you to the webinar, Promoting Gender Equality, the Streets of Israel. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind you all that this is also being in, on live stream on Facebook. <laughs> and if you want to copy with captions, we're actually going to have that uh, later, but it's all in, the, in English, so you won't need subtitles, but some people like captions, so this will be ready later. Uh, you wonder over there in, uh, in the world, what's happening in Israel that women have to fight for their presence in the, in the public sphere? I was thinking I, I, can have to, I have an object to show you what it feels like. I'm holding a shofar in my hand. You know this object. But you know, when it comes to women, the shofar is wearing a uh, mask right on the, <laughs> on the exit because women in Israel need to curb their voice, curb their body, curb their needs for expression, their creativity, because in the public sphere, they threaten the, uh, the uh, division, the gender division that is accepted in Israel. And uh, religion is, plays a major role in this. And this is where Iraq comes in. The Israel Religious Action Center holds the uh, revolutionary notion, actually two revolutionary notions. One, that women are people. And second, that there's more than one way to be Jewish in Israel. And uh, we have a, uh, a phenomenal panel here today. First, we're gonna be hearing from Rabbi Noah Satat, the director of the Israel Religious Action Center. My colleague, my friend, my mentor, my teacher, She's gonna give us a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that gives you the uh, general view of how, how, uh, how common this thing is, that women in Israel actually have to think about what they're wearing and what their, uh, what their uh, the level of their voice, the color of their shirt. And in some places, uh, there, there's actually, there are actually sanctions if they're doing the wrong thing. After this, we're going to hear from Orly Erez Lechowski. She's our, the head of the legal department at the Israel Religious Action Center. She's a leading lawyer in Israel in all things related to gender. And besides giving us the legal story, I think she's going to also talk about the personal relationship that occurred between her and Orthodox women in Beit Shemesh. Beit Shemesh, the hub of religious coercion in Israel. We're gonna hear from uh, Miriam Zussman and Nili Philip, both are colleagues of ours, sisters of ours. We're gonna hear them, uh, their personal story and what they've done to change Beit Shemesh. And finally, 20 minutes of questions. We will not leave before we hear from you. You are welcome to write us your questions on the chat and we will, mon we, will, we will try to get to all the questions at the end. And if while we talk, you feel an irresistible urge to write a check or give us an online gift in order to take part in this very important uh, endeavor, don't stop yourself. <laughs> Let yourself do it, okay? It's, it's easy as apple pie. You just need to uh, get to our um, site and, and do it. I will see you at the very end to say goodbye and Shabbat Shalom. And now to Rabbi Satat. So thank you, Anat, and thank you, friends. Um, we're um, very grateful that you're all here with us. Um, and before we uh, hear from our guests of honor and our clients and our friends and, as Anat said, our sisters, um, Oli and I wanted to frame the phenomena of gender segregation um, and talk a little bit about the history and the current challenges before we go to, um, do we dive in specifically to the issue of, uh, of Bechemish and the struggle there and the opportunities and the, um, and the major achievements that we've already had. Um, so I'm uh, going to start sharing this presentation. I think you can see it. Can you see it? Up. Okay. So gender segregation is in the public sphere is a new phenomena in Jewish life. Um, while gender segregation in synagogues is, a, is an old phenomena, gender segregation in the public sphere began in Israel in 1999 with two gender segregated bus lines uh, in Jerusalem 
where uh, the drivers uh, told passengers to um, sit for the men passengers to sit in the front and the women passengers to sit in the back. Um, by 2010, there were 96 bus lines all over Israel where gender segregation was enforced. Um, and then uh, Orly led us in this uh, very, very long um, and complicated uh, case in the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court this, uh, made a decision that segregation is discrimination. And we're so proud that we at IRAC and as a movement were, were able to set such an important pillar of democracy. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court decision uh, said that segregation on buses is illegal. And in, on every bus in Israel to this day, there's the um, uh, sticker that you see here photographed, which says uh, every passenger may sit wherever they choose. Um, and harassing a passenger on this can constitute a criminal offense, uh, which was a huge, huge legal achievement. But what we saw was that it wasn't completely, it didn't make much of a difference in the lives of women passengers. For example, you see here uh, this uh, pamphlet from the city of Beit Elit. you see here the logo of the city. Uh, and after the Supreme Court decision, they made this wonderful brochure for Hanukkah, and it says, the light of Hanukkah is shining the way. Women are, men are sitting in the front and women are sitting in the, on, in the back. Um, and the community um, insisted on continuing to enforce the, um, the discriminatory segregation practices even after the Supreme Court ruling, which is when we really understood that we needed to connect with the women who are the victims of segregation and empower them to, 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 uh, to voice their own complaints and, 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 and find their own voice. And one of those uh, is one of our youngest clients. You see here in the center, you see Ariela from Beit Shemesh, who was 13 years old when she came to us. Uh, and uh, she uh, her, was coming home from school and the driver told her to go to the back of the bus. And so she and her mother, Eve, who was uh, another longtime client came to us and um, Ariela represented herself in small claims court with the help of Orly, who you see here, and she won uh, 13,000 shekels, which is, I think, uh, about $4,000. Um, and uh, she both made a specific case for herself, but also once we had enough of these women who were complaining against specific drivers, we've since found it very, very hard to find drivers who continue to, to enforce segregation. Um, so while segregation still exists on some bus lines, it's no longer enforced by the drivers. Uh, but during those 10 years where segregation was allowed on buses, it became um, ubiquitous in other places as well. Uh, so what you see here is a mehadrin clinic, meaning uh, there's a clinic for men where only men can come in. And here you see a, a clinic for women. Uh, which creates the ridiculous situation where, for instance, um, a mother can't take a teenage son to the doctor or a, uh, or a son can't take a, an elderly mother to the doctor. Um, and, and we started this correspondence with the uh, uh, health clinics demanding that they, uh, create an, that they enforce equality and, and stop uh, segregating and discriminating. And the interesting response was, we don't interfere with the values of the community. We want ultra-Orthodox men to come to the doctor and they don't come to the doctor. So we're gonna do whatever we can to get them to come to the doctor. And if they need segregation, we'll do segregation. Um, and that's when we developed our litmus test, which is if we have a city where there's a majority white population that is racist and they don't go to the doctor and they insist on hours for white people only, would the clinic allow that? And the answer is, of course not. So if they don't allow that in that case, they shouldn't allow gender segregation as well. Uh, following the Supreme Court decision and a, and, a, and a report by the Attorney General, this situation has stopped. Um, uh, but gender segregation became uh, prevalent in other areas like cemeteries. So you see here a cemetery in Beit Shean. I don't know, in, in Kiryat Malachi, I don't know if you can see the signs where the water fountains are segregated for men and for women. Um, this is a funeral home in Aklit, 
uh, and you see that there's a mechitza inside the funeral home so that women stand on one side and men stand, stand on the other side. So families can't mourn together uh, following a uh, um, court decision and very fruitful uh, discussions with the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Uh, you can see here that the wall was destroyed and now families can mourn together. Um, but the uh, long-term effect of segregation has created the idea that exists in some sectors of Israeli society that men and boys can and should exist in a public sphere that is completely what is called clean of women. Uh, and that has very clear manifestations in the public sphere. So you, you see, for instance, here, um, uh, an ad for a clothing company, which is a clothing company for secular women. You can see that by the way they dress. And you see the ad here is in Jerusalem. And this is the ad that was run in the other parts of the country where the, woman, the woman's face is hidden. Um, this is a, um, a, a poster from, a, from a, um, Bank Apolim, which is the largest bank in Israel. And you see uh, here uh, the, the uh, ad that they put on billboards all over Israel. It says, Happy Independence Day from Bank Apolim. Um, and in Bnei Black, the woman is not only replaced by a gnome, she's replaced by a male gnome with a beard. So you know that it's totally not a woman anywhere in the public sphere. Um, and this has some very comic um, uh, options. For instance, uh, um, <laughs> this is a, um, an ad uh, by a healthcare provider for prenatal medical plans. And, and you see here those people who are very intense clients of prenatal medical plans. Um, so we've seen in, in many places the, um, the attempt to marginalize women and to segregate uh, between genders. Um, and some of the challenges, like in the buses and in the cemeteries, are in a, we're in a place where we have made tremendous progress um, and we have seen great results. It's not that the problem is completely eradicated, but we have very clear tools to address it. In other places, we are still uh, working in uh, uh, Oli, who is, our magician and our, the head of our legal department and anybody who comes to Israel, I think that the, one of the most fascinating things is to come and hear her argue in court. Uh, she's gonna take us through the challenges that we still have ahead of us. So hi everyone, good evening. It's great to be here. Um, so I wanna talk about three uh, issues before we delve into the issue of Pechemish and the modesty signs and then I'll pass. Uh, Pastor Tunili and uh, Miriam. So first of all, the issue of segregation on flights. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about it. We've heard about many instances where uh, women were asked to uh, switch seats on planes uh, because ultra-Orthodox passengers were not uh, willing to sit next to them. Uh, we took El Al uh, to court uh, a couple of years ago on the case of René Rabinovich, um, who was uh, an 83-year-old uh, Holocaust survivor who was asked to switch seats uh, on business class because an ultra orthodox man was not um, didn't, wasn't uh, willing to sit next to her. We sued El Al and uh, we won. She was uh, ordered. She was uh, um, El Al was ordered to pay damages and also to guide uh, and to tell all its crew members that such um, a practice is illegal because it's uh, discrimination and it's um, not allowed under Israeli law. You can see here uh, a billboard that we um, posted in New York Airport, uh, basically telling. All passengers that such a request is illegal and that if anybody um, uh, hears such requests they should of course refuse to do so and turn to us uh, for legal action and actually a few weeks ago we filed a new civil suit against EasyJet by uh, on behalf of a British Israeli citizen who was on an EasyJet flight from Tel Aviv to London back in these days where we could fly uh, and she was asked to move uh, so that's um, a, a brand new suit that we're just starting now to uh, argue before the court. Um, so that's the issue of, of flights, which is still going on. Um, the other two issues I wanted to mention are issues which I think pose a, a more difficult cha challenge on the case of segregation, because it's very clear to us that there is no such 
no reason to allow any segregation on buses or cemeteries or medical clinics. But when uh, we have at stake the interest of the Israeli society to integrate the ultra-Orthodox into the society, then the stakes are a little bit higher. And this manifests itself in two areas. First is the army, and the second is higher education. So um, in, for, for many years now, the state has is trying to attract ultra-Orthodox ultra um, to um, be drafted into the army. This is a very sensitive issue in Israel because many people uh, feel, and justly so, that it is um, totally unfair that uh, all Israelis other than the ultra-Orthodox are supposed to go to the army um, and they are exempt. And so um, in recent years, the state has developed different programs for ultra-Orthodox in order to attract them to the army. And basically what they're uh, um, promised is an army service which is um, and without any women. So women are not allowed at all to be a part of the service and they are promised that they would not encounter any woman at all. So here you see a woman who um, says that basically on the recruitment lines on the day of the draft, all women are basically said to um, leave their, their, um, their job at this day because uh, when the ultra-Orthodox soldiers come and enlist, they, they don't, do not want to, to see any woman. Women, so the women are just out of there and we have received uh, many complaints about uh, soldiers, female soldiers who are asked to um, not to go around in bases where ultra-Orthodox uh, ultra soldiers serve because the soldiers were promised a women-free base. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they, if they were in the dining room, they were asked to move out because the ultra-Orthodox soldiers entered the room and many other practices which are very humiliating. Um, this is uh, something that we have been collecting evidence for the past couple of years and uh, sort of thinking on um, deciding on how to challenge it legally. Uh, we have not filed a petition yet and we're also cooperating with other uh, women, women's rights organizations to get sort of the full picture of how, uh, what this current situation is because uh, of course uh, um, a female soldier which is in the army has a big problem uh, um, challenging this. I can tell you that my daughter has just uh, was just drafted two weeks ago and of course this is a very sensitive position. So many female soldiers do not complain and after they leave the army they just forget about it. So it's very hard to collect evidence but we're, we're still doing so. Um, the other context which is very problematic is the issue of higher education. You know many uh, ultra-orthodox, especially ultra-orthodox men uh, do not work, uh, but rather they study in the yeshiva for most of their lives. And there is a very um, um, big uh, economic problem in the Israeli society. And it is the major interest of uh, Israel to uh, integrate more and more ultra-Orthodox into the workforce. And um, a necessary step is to um, basically attract them or lure them into going uh, to the academy, to the university. Uh, and so the state uh, for the past nine, nine years has developed programs special programs, special campuses for ultra-Orthodox, which are totally segregated. So you can see here, this is an, um, a sign in the Haredi campus of uh, Kiryat Ono, which states there are different days for men and women. Um, also another very um, de depressing and uh, frustrating issue is the fact that while male uh, lecturers can lecture to both sexes, women can lecture only to female students. And of course, this makes the status of women in the uh, universities much worse than their male counterparts. Uh, you can sometimes even reach absurd uh, situations like the one you see here, where a lecturer has just put a mechitza inside the classroom to make sure, God forbid, that men and women wouldn't sit in class together. This is actually something that is pending before the Supreme Court now. There's a petition led by different professor universities who are against the segregation, and we have um, joined this petition, uh, filed an amicus brief, and we're waiting for the court to uh, read the decision because uh, it is very disturbing. Of course, it is important to integrate ultra-Orthodox, but not on the expense uh, of women. Uh, and this is how we reach our, um, oh, here we see just another uh, uh, very um, terrible, humiliating example of a gate that was just installed uh, as a part of uh, a campus of the um, Technological Institute in Hulon because there was a special program for actually ultra-Orthodox soldiers coming uh, bringing them to the, to the university um, and women were not allowed, women, female students were not allowed to go in there and they were just blocked and just... Uh, um, expelled from this area because it was designated to men only and of course this is something which is unacceptable and uh, should uh, should be avoided. 
Um, so uh, um, and the last issue, uh, which we're going to talk about uh, broadly today, is the issue of the modesty science. Um, modesty science um, uh, in Israel have been in some places, uh, but in Bechemesh, we are talking about modesty signs that have been hung on major streets uh, in, in Bechemesh. You will hear uh, more shortly from uh, Nili and Miriam about the nature of Bechemesh, but I can just tell you for now that Bechemesh is, has different uh, populations uh, who live together side by side, ultra-Orthodox, modern Orthodox, secular, uh, Masorti. Um, and uh, some of the signs will, I'll show you shortly are located on major streets where you cannot go through the city and not encounter them. Um, so here, for instance, you can see one, one of those signs that actually still exists, which says women are asked to refrain from walking or standing on the sidewalk. This is a sign that is hung on the entrance to a yeshiva and a synagogue. Uh, actually, right across from this uh, synagogue, there is a health clinic that many people in Bechemish use. So this is one example of this of the sign. Uh, another uh, other sign uh, states that um, be, welcome to the Haredi shopping center. Women are asked to dress modestly, and it states very specifically how women should be dressed. So it uh, so you could not be mistaken: long skirt, long sleeves, closed neck. Um, we uh, have uh, contacted uh, um, a, a group of an amazing, brave uh, women in Bechemesh, uh, Nili, Miriam, and uh, there are a few more women which we have um, been in touch with. Uh, we, um, the first contact was in uh, 2011, um, and uh, we decided to fight this phenomenon together. You'll hear soon about what and, uh, uh, Nili and Miriam have been, been through before deciding to launch this fight. Um, but we decided to take the municipality to court because those signs are illegal. Okay, nobody, of course, asked permission to, to hang them. And the content of the, si content of the signs themselves is uh, humiliating and is illegal under Israeli law. Uh, the attorney general agreed with us, stating that those signs are illegal and should be taken off. But the municipality for many years um, refused to do so and actually sided with the people who hung them. Uh, the radical people um, who decided to hang those signs. It took us many, many years, and we've gone uh, from the lower courts to the um, um, uh, district court and to the Supreme Court. Um, eventually, the uh, municipality has started to take down some of the signs, but as you see here in the picture, the signs were hung up uh, right again, so it was sort of, we started sort of a cat and mouse um, um, run. Um, we, at the end, the Supreme Court uh, two years ago gave a decision stating that uh, the municipality should take down those signs. Um, I can show you, I know you can move uh, another um, slide. Um, some signs, uh, you know, this is a relatively new sign from just a couple of years ago. Uh, it is located on the top of, of uh, the stairs at the central um, central uh, roundabout in the major street of the Chemish. And it says that during the busy hours, men are asked to use the right side of the stairs and women the left side. Uh, and um, you'll hear shortly that those signs did not, were not just signs, but people actually try to enforce them on women. Um, so um, of course, this is something that cannot be, uh, cannot be allowed and we're not going to, to accept it. Um, now you could move, uh, yeah, so uh, it's not only science, but um, even the, uh, this is a health, a health center, a women health clinic, um, um, in, in quite a central place in Bechemesh. And you see the Hebrew word woman, women, Haisha, is uh, actually sprayed upon with the graffiti and it has been so for many years. So nobody even tries to erase it because even the mere mention of the word women uh, is immodest and shouldn't be allowed. Um, uh, the fact, of course, we're not accepting this uh, uh, notion, uh, and the, it, the Attorney General stated that a democratic society cannot accept the notion that the mere presence of a woman in a public place without doing anything is hurtful to, so, so hurtful that she should be restricted in any way. So this is, of course, uh, unacceptable in Israel. Um, a major uh, change uh, came from the political front uh, in the last municipal elections two years ago in October 2018. Uh, the, the mayor, who was um, 
in office for quite a few years, uh, was uh, actually kicked out of office. He was an ultra-Orthodox mayor, as I said, that backed up those signs and was actually very much against our fight. Uh, but he was he lost the election, and instead, uh, the new mayor is a female woman. She's uh, she's Orthodox. Uh, her name is Eliza Bloch. So you can see here on the right, the uh, former mayor. On the left, uh, the the new mayor, who is now um, the mayor of Pechemish. She came with a rather um, different attitude. She agreed with us that this is something that should be, the design should be taken off, and this is unacceptable. Uh, and we have been in, di in a very long dialogue with her. Um, she has done something. She has taken some of the signs. She has tried to raise some of the graffiti because as you've seen in the pictures, there are also graffiti calling for modest uh, clothing. Uh, but uh, it's still not solved completely, but we're definitely a long way ahead and in a different place than we've been um, back uh, five or six years ago. So um, I want to now uh, present you or introduce uh, Miriam and Nili and hear their stories. Um, so I'll start with Nili. Uh, Nili Philip is um, uh, married and she has five kids uh, and she's been living in Israel for 28 years. Uh, she um, uh, was born in Canada, right Nili? Um, uh, 20 uh, of those years she has been living in Bechemish for the last 20 years. Uh, and professionally, she's a computer engineer. Uh, and actually, after uh, starting our legal battle, she has starting to study law. And she very recently graduated and is now actually uh, doing her uh, law clerkship. Uh, she works as, um, as a patent attorney, and she's specializing in computer ele electronics, optics, and mechanics. And she actually has two patents under her name and one pending in encrypting technologies. Uh, her social activism has focused on gender equality in Bachamish and beyond. And together with Miriam and Iraq, um, we sued the city for the modesty signs. Uh, she was deeply involved in the municipal elections in 2013, so not the last municipal elections, but the one before them, in an attempt to replace the Haredi mayor with a democratic candidate. And in 2018, uh, ran for city council under the Labour Party's ticket. And now, more recently, she's involved in establishing a hostel for young religious women at risk. So, um, should I introduce Miriam, or first let... Uh... Mm -hmm. Okay, so let, let's hear from Lily, and then uh, we'll introduce Miriam. So, thank you so much for, giving, uh, for inviting us to this webinar, and giving us uh, this opportunity to speak. And I think that the most important thing for me about our cooperation with IRAC was that Orly gave us uh, a voice. And uh, as you can see, the Hajarat Nashim, the elimination of women, sidelines us, sidelines women. And all sorts of decisions are made for us without our input. And no one consults with us, and no one asks us what we think or how we feel about these things. And what Orly is doing is giving women like me and like the little girl we saw earlier a chance to say, no, this is not okay. You can't treat us this way. You can't trample on our rights this way. So I just want to, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the work that, that Orly does and that IRAC do in defending fundamental rights of women, every woman, every woman from across all colors, all religious outlooks, Hiloni outlooks, Arab, Jewish alike. Uh, it's just quintessentially important work. Um, so my, my experience with this actually began with, with being assaulted. I was riding my bike on a public street in Bechemish on a main thoroughfare. I'm um, sort of a, a, a recreational athlete and I was um, attacked I had already been spat on numerous times and called shiksa and like sworn at and cursed, but I was never outright physically assaulted. Some women had been, and so I was aware, but you know, you're always in denial until it happens to you. And someone threw a rock and it hit me in the head. Unfortunately, I was wearing a, uh, a helmet. And two months after that, my daughter's school, a religious girl's school was under siege. Uh, some ultra-Orthodox people in the city decided that they wanted that school, they wanted the building. And the language that they know is force, their tech tactics are force, and they tried to take the school by force. I was still very traumatized, 
um, from my own personal attack. So I was, I, I, I facilitated in that struggle, but I took a back seat. The following year, really a year after my assault, a, a woman, a young woman was assaulted in, in what I can only say is the most heinous thing I can possibly think of. The only thing that comes close is, is the description of Amalek in, in the desert. A woman with an infant in her arms was in uh, Ramat Pachemesh Bet, which is a Haredi neighborhood, what we call a Haredi neighborhood. She was looking for a stroller. It was June. She knew where she was going. She wore a long skirt. She wore a t-shirt with sleeves. And it wasn't good enough. And she was assaulted by a gang. And they went at her with six, with, with bars. And a Haredi woman in the area actually rescued her. And, and as she was escaping, they went after her again. She was leaving. And they threw rocks. They pelted rocks at the, at the car. And, and they, um, they, they broke the window. Now, there was a three-month infant in this woman's arms as she was being assaulted in the street. They broke the window in the car. It, just by a miracle, this, this infant wasn't harmed. Um, and I and my friends, Miriam, Eve, and the other women who joined this lawsuit and the other women who expressed, we, we just saw red at that point. This was like, tomorrow cannot be like yesterday. This is not going to go away. We can, in the past, we complained, we posted things on Facebook. This time it was different. This, this is war. And, and I, I literally, when I, when I, I can only, I saw red and, and it was rage. Just, just uh, uh, rage at something that was outrageous, that that should never happen again, that that, that can't happen, and and the order of the day has to change from here on. The whole discussion of the public sphere has to change from here on. And what Orly was able to do, and we were just uh, uh, rage. <laughs> so we were posting on Facebook and going to the police and filing complaints and whatnot. And Orly managed to focus all that rage into a tactical um, offense of taking the city to court over something seemingly banal, like these modesty signs, which were actually, uh, was for us living in Bet Shemesh, a way of poking our finger in the eye of the people who were harassing, assaulting, and attacking women. Um, so I actually had to do a lot of Hasbara explanation um, as to why we were going after the signs. Everyone was telling me, well, look, there's these things that are 10 million times worse than the signs. Why are you going after that? Um, but, you know, and, and here's uh, Orly's brilliance. As a tactician, you fight a battle that you can win. And the law is very clear about the signs. We know exactly who we're going after. It's the same people. And we have a really good chance of winning, and we can point to the evidence. It's very hard to catch these people on the physical assault. It's a revolving door in, in, in the, um, at the police station. And I'm, I'm sorry, it sounds racist, but they do all look alike. They dress alike, and they all have beards covering their faces. So it's hard to identify them. And this was easy to point at the smoking gun. The evidence is out in the open. We know we're, we know we're hurting the people that we want to hurt. And we know that the law is very clear. So it was really tactically uh, just a brilliant move by Orly. And it's been long and drawn out. Uh, I would say it's, the success is kind of, well, not the most satisfactory. We, we won in court. We won on paper. Um, the facts on the ground speak otherwise. And that's really unfortunate. But to me, most importantly, was finding our voice. Orly gave us that voice. Orly let us be heard that we're not okay with how things are going. We're not okay by being told what to wear in the street. We're not okay with our girls being told what to wear or what side of the street to walk on or where to sit on the bus. It's not okay. And it's not gonna go away quietly. And if we can just be pains, just, just, a, just a nag, just a nuisance, nasty women, really nasty women. That's good, that's fine because the order of the day has to change. It cannot be convenient. It cannot be comfortable. It cannot be easy for them to trample on our rights. And what Orly's work is doing, whether we win or lose in court, whether we win on the ground or not, it doesn't matter. The point is that we're pains in their neck. And, 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 and we found our voice and they're aware of it. And then we're aware of we're just not going to lie down and, and put up with it quietly and suffer quietly. That, that is over. That, those days are gone. 
Thank you, Warley. From the bottom of my heart. <laughs> My, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Neely. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really been a, an honor to represent you and all the other amazing women. You, you're really on the front line. I'm just uh, the vessel to bring your voice. Um, so now I want to introduce Miriam. Miriam is a fixed income portfolio manager for an investment firm in Boston, and she has worked in finance for 38 years. Uh, shortly after moving to Israel in 1999, she became active in community project in Bet Shemesh. And in 2001, she was involved with a small, small group of parents uh, to start a more liberal girls high school in the city called Amit Noga. Uh, two years later, a boys school followed uh, called Amit Nachshon. And in 2013, she joined Anili um, uh, and other women in Iraq in the lawsuit against the city. Uh, that same year, she started a nonprofit that launched a leadership education program for at-risk Ethiopian youth. So uh, Miriam would be happy to hear your story. Thank you. Um, just on, the, on a personal note, um, uh, as I said, I met, as Orly said, I met Aliyah uh, 21 years ago to Beit Shemesh with my, uh, my husband and four children. I'm originally a Bronx girl, so a uh, native New Yorker. Um, I also just like to, it's hard to follow um, Neely's uh, enthusiasm and passion, but I'll give it a shot. Um, I'd also like to really uh, reiterate um, just the depths of gratitude to Iraq um, for, uh, for, for, for helping us. Uh, the reason Iraq and the courts are so important is that given the political situation in Israel, uh, the sort of split um, uh, views um, of, of, of the electorate, the ultra-Orthodox or the swing. Um, and as a result of that, they have a disproportionate amount of power in this country. Um, it's manifested in the Knesset. So the, the really, and, and that's why the situation that, that Neely described, the, the frustration has, has, has continued for so long because of um, their, their immense political power. And that's why the courts, um, and, and Iraq and Orly's work is, is, is so important because it really is the one tool that we have to, to fight back um, against, uh, against what's been going on. Um, so I, I joined Neely. Neely is, is, the, is the fearless leader. Um, but uh, my own experiences, I also, I didn't get, have, did not have a rock thrown at my head, but I, I uh, and it's interesting, like right now my hair is uncovered and, and uh, my sleeves are short, but the times that I was assaulted and called um, shiksa was, um, I was wearing, my head was covered. I was wearing a long skirt, long sleeves. It, 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 it was, I was just walking in, 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 um, in, in past the Haredi neighborhood and, and, and you got yelled at. Um, and, and so it, it's really the, the, the issue and, and, and what's also so important is this sort of partnership between Orthodox reform um, where really, uh, the values that we share are, 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 are common and, and just the personal, what, when it hit me and, and the reason I was so open to draw, to join the suit wasn't even the times that I got, you know, called names and yelled at and, and spat at. But one day I was in my house, the houses here tend to be cool, um, cooler than the outdoors sometimes in the heat of the summer. And I was, um, I was wearing um, uh, a sweatshirt in my house with a t-shirt underneath. And then I, I, I had an appointment um, that I was a little bit late for, and I wanted to walk. Uh, so I started walking to, to Ramat Beit Shemesh um, Aleph, where my doctor was from where I lived. And in between, I had to pass a, um, uh, the ultra-Orthodox Ramat Beit Shemesh Bet, where a lot of the signs, um, uh, problematic signs are. And um, kind of wasn't thinking, didn't focus on the weather. And as I'm walking, and it's, a, it's like a 20-minute uphill walk, um, the sun is beating down. Uh, but the weather outside was very different from my house. And I'm wearing a sweatshirt. Underneath, I have a short sleeve t-shirt on. Um, and I was dying to take this sweatshirt off. And I didn't because I was afraid. I was afraid, despite the fact that, you know, this heavy duty sun was beating down on me, that if I took my sweatshirt off, I would be physically attacked. And I got through and nothing happened, but it was that notion 
that I had to um, walk that way out of, out of fear for, for attack um, that just sat with me for, for months. And then when Neely called and said, Miriam, a group of us are doing this, are, are, are you interested? Um, and I was like, yeah, we, we have to do something. And perhaps it was the, um, the activism of the, of the 60s and the 70s when I grew up, um, the Soviet Jewry movement where, you know, I remember the war March on Washington in 1987 when Gorbachev was in the White House that sort of gave me the belief that, you know, we can change things. And so that when the opportunity came up and the partnership that we're so grateful for came up, um, you know, we, uh, you know, there were a bunch of us like this um, that, that said, yeah, let, 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 let's do it and let's, um, let's deal, uh, let, let, let's fight, let's fight back. So just so much gratitude, um, hard to overstate it for, for giving us the opportunity to really make a difference. Um, so thank you, uh, all of you for this inspiring talk and we are opening it up for questions and Ken asked, I think this is for Orly, is there no recourse when municipalities do not act after the Supreme Court has spoken? So actually, uh, we've um, uh, just, just before you start, I'm encouraging sure. all of you to, uh, um, ask questions either in the chat or in the Q and a. Um, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. So as I said, we, st we started with the lower court here. Um, uh, we asked for damages uh, against the municipality because they did not take off the illegal sign and we, we won and the municipality paid damages uh, to Nili and Miriam and, and a few other women. We, saw it, uh, we sued on their behalf. Uh, and then we filed another legal um, uh, petition asking the municipality to take the signs down. The municipality at first refused, and then after the judge uh, really pressed them, they said, okay, we agree to take down the signs. Um, they took some of them down, but some they didn't. So we um, brought, uh, a, a, and we, we uh, filed a request um, on, the basis, on the law, basis of the law of contempt of court, because we said basically the municipality put the court in contempt because they did not do what the court uh, has ordered them to do when they actually agreed to the decision themselves. Uh, and the court accepted this request and decided that if they do not take down all the signs, they'll have to pay 10,000 shekels a day, so around, I don't know, $2,500 a day for every day they did not take the signs down. So instead of taking the signs down, they appealed to the Supreme Court and this is how the case uh, reached the Supreme Court, which was a good thing because the Supreme Court was completely, completely sided with us uh, and turned to the municipality, told them this is not uh, acceptable and also turned to the police saying, okay, the municipality should take down the signs, the police should be there to help the municipality and to try to catch those people who put the signs back up. Uh, and this case has been going on for almost a year and then um, gave the final decision that the municipality has a couple of more months to take all the signs down. Otherwise, they'll, ha they'll have to pay the fine, the fine of, fine of uh, 10,000 shekels a day. Um, after uh, Aliza Bloch, the new mayor, was elected, we agreed uh, to postpone the deadline that the court has given uh, because we understood there is a new leadership and we can have a new a, a dialogue with her. Uh, and actually, we've agreed to the extension for, for a, a few more times since then. Um, I can tell you that the new mayor has installed uh, security cameras in order for uh, the, municipality, the municipality to be able to track down the people who hang down the signs. And some of the signs have been taken down, but there is still a lot of graffiti um, calling for a modest clothing. Uh, and we're still sort of waging um, uh, this fight. So for now on, we still, I saw that someone asked what, uh, what other legal pro procedures we have now um, pending in this issue. So now we have this Supreme Court case, which the municipality still has to uh, implement. Thank you. Um, so um, Neely and Miriam, these are, I think, both connected in, uh, in, uh, uh, for you. Uh, the questions are, what proportion of the Beit Shemesh population is ultra-Orthodox? And the other is, this seems to be like the segregation is a new phenomena. Uh, what made it so bad? The, the answer on the population is it's, um, it's probably about 50%. 
Um, from the political perspective, though, their voting rates are about 80 to 90 percent. So it gives them an electoral majority, so to speak. But but in general, it's about it's, it's really an evenly um, split uh, split population. Um, what made it so bad? Um, it's interesting. And Neil, you, I'm going to you're probably going to put some more meat on the bones. But but as I understand it, but, you know, Beit Shemesh is uh, Haredim and Beit Shemesh is is, is a relatively new um, phenomenon. It's, it's within the last couple of decades. Some of the people that came to the community um, were of the more extreme from Mea Sha'arim and Bnei Brak. And, and that that set a bit of a tone here in terms of them them. Um, uh, uh, using their power, um, and and a lot of it is economic, where they they will um, you know rabbis will go to publications and say do not put in pictures of women or otherwise you know nobody will 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 advertise with you. So just like they have the block for the political power, they also use their um they're they're very astute about using their power um, from an economic perspective. And that has been, and we haven't touched on this phenomenon, but the, the issue of women, you know, being erased from, from uh, newspapers, magazines, publications, even in even ones that, that apply to um, non, non um, ultra orthodox communities where there's sort of a, uh, it, it applies to the, the, the whole city. They, they, they flex their, their economic muscles that way and are able to um, bully publishers into not showing pictures of women. Um, yeah, so I'll just pipe in a little bit there. Um, I think what we're seeing in the Orthodox world is just the general polarization, which you're seeing across the world. You're seeing it in Christian circles, too. There's extremism and Muslim circles, and we have that here. It's exacerbated by uh, a political system that sees these people as allies. Ironically, on the one hand, they deny the state and they deny the legitimacy of the state, but they have learned to vote as a bloc and they are key to coalitions, so people put up with them. Uh, so the political system kind of turns a blind eye. We don't have any allies within the coalition. We never have. Um, but I think most important, more importantly, Israeli society, and, and, and this, is, this should interest, I think, everybody, and here's where Iraq really plays such a key role. Israeli society is incredibly sexy. It's only been a few years, really, when women started to become integrated more in the army, and it seems like, or, or the workforce, and it just seems like at the very first opportunity that they got to like throw women to the bot, to the side, that, that they just, I'm talking about secular people. They couldn't, they, they, their finger couldn't move fast enough, you know, uh, uh, to push the button to say, fine, we'll put up with the, with the ultra orthodox uh, demands. We're perfectly happy to return to our comfortable old boys club and get rid of these annoying women. So I, I think there's some ingrained sexism from the military, from being a country in the Middle East, from the religious aspect. Um, our, our real enemies, really, it's, it's not the ultra-Orthodox. They're bad. But it's the cooperation and capitulation and almost a, a, a eager cooperation at times of the secular world who just shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, it's, a perfectly, it's perfectly fine to uh, 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 ban women lecturers from lecturing. I mean, it's just preposterous, right? How, the women are only finally allowed into academia, that they've even reached uh, uh, the, the, the status of being a pr professor with all of the other uh, uh, hurdles in their way. And now at the first opportunity, they're just saying, oh, well, we'll just have to push these women aside. And, uh, and, and, and this is where, uh, you know, it's, it's um, we see it the most extreme aspect in the Shemesh, in the Haredi neighborhoods, but it's a slippery slope and it, it permeates across Israeli society everywhere. I agree and I want to I want to expand on that a little bit. I think that um, in terms of what we're seeing, we're seeing two parallel phenomena. One is we're seeing the growth in segregation, which started a few years after the revolution of um, ultra-Orthodox women in higher education. So women in the ultra-Orthodox community for, for decades were mostly sent to work in education either, either as teachers and, or as kindergarten teachers. And in the 90s was the first wave of higher education for ultra-Orthodox women. Um, and actually today, ultra-Orthodox women are more educated and earning more money than ever before. 
So now ultra orthodox women are becoming more senior, both in self software industries and in, um, in law and many, many different avenues that were close to them in the past. So in some ways, what we're seeing here is, is backlash to the progress of women in the ultra orthodox community, which was made because of economic um, needs inside the community. Uh, but this need to, when they're advancing so much professionally and educationally, to still keep, keep them uh, in the back of the bus. Um, I, uh, I'm turning to all of you, all three of you, with two interesting questions. One from Judy is, um, do the majority of ultra-Orthodox women in this society agree uh, and support this discrimination? Maybe Orly, you can talk about some of our surveys, and Neely and Miriam, maybe you can talk about your impressions. Um, and uh, Peter is asking about what models should be used for the military. Should the Haredi be sent to some other form of public service or what else can be done in the military? Um, I think that um, about the attitude of ultra-Orthodox women, it's a very interesting question. I think that the ultra-Orthodox sector, like any other sector, has many different opinions. Uh, you know, it's not just one block of people who has one opinion, but there is a variety of opinions. But usually we don't hear all of them. We hear just the more radical ones. And for many years, the state has sort of um, sided with this radical opinion and did not even try to hear the other voices. Neely mentioned, you know, we give them a voice. There are many other voices and there are many women and men within the ultra-orthodox sector who are against segregation. And I can tell you that during our fight against uh, segregation on buses, we have received um, several phone calls from ultra-orthodox women. They called us unanimously because, of course, they, they cannot allow themselves to be publicly associated with the reform movement. But they told us, you are waging our fight. We thank God that there are reform in the world because you are fighting the fight that we cannot uh, allow ourselves or afford ourselves to, to, do it or to do it because we feel it. It's humiliating to sit at the back of the bus, but, but we cannot go against it publicly because then we would be labeled not real ultra-Orthodox or not religious enough. Uh, and we've seen it in other cases uh, that we have a, a pretty large segment in the society which is against this radicalization and they are against segregation and against exclusion of women, but they, their voices are not heard. So uh, we are really trying to give uh, those women uh, their voice uh, and of course, since the law is on our side, we also say, of course, it's illegal, but it's not only legal, it's also against the will of some of the people uh, within this community. Um, and as to the army, I can say that this is a real, a real conflict uh, as to what price we want to pay. Um, um, we want to integrate, we want to have more uh, ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox soldiers in the army, but we do, don't and want women to pay the price, I think. There are some restrictions which are legitimate and which are uh, allowed to uh, Orthodox soldiers, not ultra Orthodox, but Orthodox. That of course they're not. They're allowed not to uh, touch uh, uh, female soldiers and not to be together, you know, in a hood um, um, together. But the, it's, it's it's clear that the current restrictions that are given or that are imposed on women. Uh, because uh, of ultra Orthodox soldiers, they are clearly beyond the red line and should not be allowed. Uh, Nili, Miriam, do you wanna do you wanna share with us your thoughts about how ultra orthodox women feel about segregation? Um, people have turned to me. I, some some women, some women shrug their shoulders, and go, "What do you? What does it bother you?" You know, the signs are being told what to wear, and when you begin to explain it, then they come around and they go, "Oh, like they." It's not necessarily obvious, um, but yeah, quite a few have have come to us and, and thanked us for um, for uh, fighting their battle. What I particularly like is is that a number of schoolgirls from one of the more small C conservative schools that will connote here in the city decided to make the sign issue their project, their school project, with the full support of their principal. Um, and this is sort of a, I would say, a very small, and uh, not Haredi, uh, Zionist, but but very hardline religious, and the girls with the full support of their principal uh, saw the sign. The struggle about the signs is, is legitimate, and they themselves took it on. They raised the flag, so that was that was very very um, um, satisfying. 
Um, I don't have a lot to add, but you know, Noah, Noah said something interesting about the progress in certain ways in the, within Haredi society. It was born out of economic necessity, but of, the, of women having more opportunities professionally um, in higher paying fields. But I think sometimes they need to pay with that by being even more careful and more conservative in terms of how they dress and the image that they present within their communities. So I, I think it's, it's really hard for, for, for most of them to um, either even have an opinion on it or certainly pick that battle um, when uh, within their society, um, status is achieved by being a good girl and, and following the rules that are set for you by, by men. So I, I don't think most ortho, ultra-Orthodox women support this, um, support us, but I do think that on the margin there, there definitely are some. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, this is really the, 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 the fight of, of people that value tolerance, pluralism, um, a democracy, liberalism, and uh, protection of, of, of the protection of, of basic rights for, for people. And, uh, you know, I would love for the ultra Orthodox woman to support it, but um, I, don't, I don't think we should be holding our breath on that one. Uh, so, the, so there are a couple of political questions that I wanted to, to ask people here. I've asked about uh, an ongoing voter registration effort. So actually, Low voter turnout is not a big problem in Israel. Uh, in our last uh, elections, we had our record high um, uh, voting turnout of over 70% of the voters um, in a third election cycle. So people are very engaged in the political system via voting. Uh, the ultra-Orthodox community is super engaged. Uh, and it's, you know, being progressive Jews, I sometimes say, you know, it's very uh, frustrating that there are rabbis who can just tell their people to go vote and how to vote, and they all do it. And some rabbis don't say that, or their people wouldn't listen to them. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big question how we turn the independent thinking of our people, which we love, into political power. And I'm sure there's a way to do that. There was a question about a women's party. There were several attempts, but none of them were successful. Um, and there was a question about how um, the difference between progressive Jews uh, and non-practicing secular Jews on this issue. So basically, I think that the entire progressive camp, which includes everybody from modern Orthodox to uh, uh, secular and reform and conservative, there is quite a unanimous agreement against segregation. I think that um, maybe in the more practicing, Jewishly observant, practicing uh, parts of the camp, we are more able to take on the segregation as in, in saying, you know, we are Jewish, we have a, a strong Jewish identity, and we're not, um, we're not going to be complicit when Judaism is being manipulated to justify sexism. So we're more confident in that when some, maybe some secular Jews, they're saying, this man with a beard who's saying, well, the Judaism says that we have to segregate. And they're like, okay, well, maybe that's what Judaism says. So I think that the, the more uh, fluent uh, we are in Judaism, the more uh, ownership we have of Judaism, the less reluctant we are to allow uh, for segregation and discrimination to happen in the name of Judaism. Um, before I turn the last question to Neely and um, uh, and Miriam, there was a question from Ken about how you can learn about our ongoing uh, cases. Ken, I'm sending everybody the uh, sign up link to the IRAC newsletter where you can learn more about our work. And we share cases that we do every week in English so that uh, people around the world can hear about them. Um, Nini there, and, and Miriam, there was a question about whether you face backlash in your communities because of um, your activism. Um, I'll, I'll take that first. And I'm, uh, on this issue, I, I've, I've often said that of my projects, this is probably, in terms of backlash within the community, an easy one. And it, the answer is no. Uh, especially because the lawsuit was started, 
um, when the city was just, when everyone felt so persecuted by the um, ultra-Orthodox mayor. I, I, I've, I've encountered on this issue almost no pushback and, and a lot of actual support. Um, and the fact that it was with the reform movement, even though Beit Shemesh is a pretty, um, even the modern Orthodox community here is, is, is pretty uh, conservative with a little C, um, I, I, I think they, they valued the partnership um, with Iraq. You know, the, uh, this, the, starting the girls' high, um, high school that um, taught Gemara and that allowed girls to go in the army, there, um, there was a lot more pushback and um, it was seen as pushing the envelope within the community. Um, so yes, I, I do think that, you know, in general, if you would ask people, I mean, I'm gonna answer, you know, throw Neely in here, you know, how are Miriam and, and Neely viewed? I, look, I think that there's a recognition that we do a lot of good and that our hearts are in the right place and we care. On, on the other hand, you know, I, I think that there would be plenty of people that would say, um, you know, troublemakers of, 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 of a sort, maybe necessary troublemakers, but we do have that uh, label. It gets, it gets tiring, actually. It gets exhausting. And, and, and you know, sometimes your feelings are hurt. Um, on the other hand, um, I, you know, we, I feel so grateful that, you know, uh, I'm able with, with partners to, to make a real change. So, yeah, we're going we're gonna to continue to live with some of that criticism. Um, so I'll pipe in. Yeah, I, I, I side with uh, Miriam. I, I had some explaining to do when we started this, um, but by and large, we really did get a lot of support uh, from, from, from the community. We also received at one point death threats and we got this uh, the notorious Pulsa de Nora cur uh, curse. So that, that, there we got a lot of communal support. Uh, everybody was really, you know, uh, uh, came out and nothing, even if they disagreed with us, nothing could justify that, that kind of just uh, uh, assault, really, uh, on our safety. Um, but I, I also just want to, I, I guess I want to frame this, uh, and going back to what Rabbi Noah was, was saying, um, a, a long-term struggle. And, and here, ironically, I actually think we should learn from the Haredim, and I think we should learn from the, the fundamental Christians, the anti-abortion uh, 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 struggle. And not, not actually their arguments, but their tactics. They, they don't give up. If they don't make it through the front door, they try the side door. If they don't try to make the side door, they go through that back door. This is, we're in this for the long term. We're at a fundamental uh, uh, battle of values. And a court case isn't going to change it overnight. We have to change people's minds. We have to change people's hearts. And that means that we have to really uh, stick to our guns and be those nasty women that people don't like. But at some point, it's like water on a stone. You know, the message will get through. And, we, and I think this partnership of, of sort of cross-religious uh, spectrum is really so important. And I think it speaks volumes. Uh, it tells people on the other side, hey, we're willing to cross that bridge. You know, we have some fundamental uh, um, uh, uh, differences in our outlook. But on this, we're full, full partners. And I think that's a very strong message as well. Wow. Thank you. So I'm going to give it to Annette to end the, uh, conclude the, the program with, uh, with these inspiring messages. So thank you again all the participants and thank you everybody uh, that, that listened to this uh, webinar. This is not such an easy topic, but uh, Iraq's job is to comfort the disturbed. Those of you who are disturbed, you should know that you should be comforted that we are a uh, fighting and finding allies such as our wonderful guests. But also our job is to disturb the comfortable. Mm -hmm. And we, if you are comfortable with what's happening in Israel, uh, there's reason to uh, worry and, and uh, stand by those Israelis like us who are uh, mending Israel because it is the most important Jewish project of our lifetime and we are partners in making it work. Uh, there is a link right here, here, right? There's a link on this that you can see and if you want to uh, give us a gift online. This would be a wonderful thing. And if you just want to continue writing us and uh, connecting with us, this would be wonderful too. Uh, 
I know that some of our friends are watching, Jan and Art and Danny. So shalom to uh, special friends that, uh, that I, I'm limited in my technology. They're the ones I picked up, but many others. Toda raba, and uh, may we have a happy and healthy new year. Uh, the year 5781 since the creation of the planet. If you believe that, Noah, you are a great rabbi. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's enjoy this new year and hopefully the world will heal. Toda raba and shana